Social Security provides a foundation for retirement income, but the benefits are modest and it can be a challenge to live on Social Security alone, particularly with the rising cost of everyday goods and services. Hello and welcome to Rural America Live with AARP. I'm Christina Loren. Social Security is a key component of the American Retirement Plan, but many of us don't completely understand how to make the most of it and failure to understand your options can be costly. Tonight, our special guest brings his 40 years of experience to the table to give us a comprehensive, meaningful look at Social Security. And our friends from AARP will share resources to help you navigate your personal road to financial security. And you at home are a big part of this show. You could be a winner tonight. Our question of the month is, how does Social Security help you and your family? Ah, I bet you might be thinking about your answer to that question. Well, if so, give us a call because we're giving away a hard-sided cooler to five lucky on-air callers tonight. Pick up the phone, join our conversation. Our phone lines are open right now. The number is 877-283-7570. As a friendly reminder, you don't need to be over the age of 50 or even a member of AARP to win, but you can only win one time each calendar year. You will get your cooler, but be patient. If you are a winner tonight, AARP will call you back in the next few days to confirm your mailing address. So be sure to take their call or return their call if they leave you a message. And now we welcome our friends from AARP, two familiar faces, Sarah Jennings, Regional Vice President for AARP, and Greg Marshallden joins us tonight as well, AARP Director for the State of Vermont. And a little bit later on, we have a very special guest for you, Social Security expert Stephen Richardson is going to join us to unlock the mystery of Social Security benefits. I want to give you that number one more time because you at home are a really big part of this show That's as right. well. 877-283-7570 is the number to call and join our conversation. This show is loaded with useful information. I know our viewers have questions and we will get to them, but let's start with some basic questions. Sarah, how do social security payments work? Yeah, absolutely. And there, as you said, there's a lot of different angles to Social Security, and when we bring on our expert, he can answer all your questions. So there's that number on your screen right now. Go ahead and you know give us a call to talk to us about what Social Security means to you and your family. But also, if you have a question, we will have answers. So give us a call. So when I want to talk about the kind of the basic Social Security benefit, and that's you know maybe not disability, but just the regular Social Security that a lot of us think about, which helps you in retirement. And for that, you have to have worked and paid into to be eligible, and you have to have worked 40 retirement credits, which is essentially 10 years, and paid into it, and then be at least 62. So there's those two things before you can start collecting. But whether you want to start collecting right at 62, if you even if you have those 40 credits, is another big question. So if you have some, we have some tools and things we're going to share later in the program to help you figure out that puzzle. Um, and then some people might be wondering, you know, if you get your your uh, check right now and your the income you get from Social Security, that's great. But some of you that may not be quite at that point might be wondering, like, how much am I going to get? Well, there's a lot again of great tools out there that help you answer that question and the one that I want to really drive people to is to go ahead and get your account set up with the Social Social Security Administration at www.ssa.gov and go ahead and take those easy steps, put in some information, and then you will be able at that site be able to see what your estimated benefit will be when you're ready to claim and it can give you some different Um, Again, keys to that puzzle so that you can figure out when it might make the most sense. If you haven't paid into Social Security, there's um, a chance that you will not be eligible. However, as I said earlier, there are different components to the program, such as the spousal benefit. So um, there might be a situation where you will receive a benefit even if you don't have that 40 retirement credits. Mm -hmm. So we're ready for those questions about your situation. And again, in the second second part of the show, um, we hope we get lots of different questions we can get to. Absolutely. I know AARP is very concerned about the lifestyle that everybody gets to live, especially as we age. Many people want to age where they are. They don't want to have to move. And so the Social Security payment is incredibly important. Now, something that we did see was a pretty significant increase. And with the large COLA increase this year, unfortunately, scammers are out there making the most of it. Greg, what should we be on the lookout for? 
Well, you know, all good things, right? So the COLA increase this year really got scammers and criminals very excited because obviously a COLA increase meant more money into the pockets of um, Social Security folks who, who need this money. So the increase um, created, frankly, an array of problems. Um, and what we're seeing out there is a bunch of scams. And so one of the, we're going to talk about a couple of them tonight, but one that I really want to talk about uh, is called, um, let me make sure I want to get this right here, it is called Spray and Pray, as crazy as that sounds. But listen to this. With the software programs that people can buy or just download, frankly, for free, these scammers can dial out millions of phone numbers in a matter of minutes. And they can do that also by targeting places where there's large populations of older Americans. Mm. So if you're dialing out millions of numbers and maybe only scam 10 or 15 people on a given day, that's 40 or 50 or $100,000 those scammers may take in one day. And that's a pretty good day's work for those criminals. So um, it, you got to ask for, you know, make sure that you're protecting yourselves. One of the things that they're doing here is that <clears throat> they're saying, oh, we're going to help you here, and you're just going to give us a bunch of your personal information, and we're going to process this fee for you to make sure that the cold increase comes through to you, which, of course, mm -hmm. is a giant scam and a way for them to get your personal information this time, but they're going to be able to use it again and again and again. So what happens to you once could happen to you twice, three times, four times, and this is common with scams all across the board. Um, and then finally, um, <clears throat> they use, a, 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 again, other software technology called spoofing. So when the number comes in and you look on your caller ID, it says Social Security Administration. So you pick up the phone, right? Um, this makes it very dangerous. Important thing to remember, Social Security Administration or anybody that works for the Social Security Administration will never, ever call you on the phone and ask for your personal information. So don't give it. Again, the best advice with these phone calls is, is that if you don't recognize the number coming in, don't pick it up, let it go to voicemail. And if it's a real caller that's someone that you know or your doctor or your grandchild, then you can call them back. But it's a very sophisticated scam. And with the increase in COLA payments and more money going into the pockets of people 65 and older, this made it for a real rich opportunity for scammers to pray. Yeah, that, that's really tough because, I mean, even me, after hearing this from you moments ago, if I saw the Social Security Administration right. on my phone, I would yeah. really right. want to Absolutely. pick up that call. Absolutely. Right? Absolutely. I, you have some more tips for us. As I, I do, I do. And on that Social Security Administration example, you know, again, they won't call and ask for information. So if there's an issue that you're having with your check or you think you might need to, you got you can go into the local office. You can make that call proactively. So that's one tip we always talk about with people. If someone's calling you for information, take a breath. That's my number one yeah. um my number one tip is take a breath, take a pause, don't provide that information right away, and really make sure and confirm that it is indeed, you know, that you do need to provide information to a legitimate organization like the Social Security Administration. The second tip is don't transfer money. So if you get someone calling and asking you to transfer money or to go buy a gift card or to get some cryptocurrency or to do a wire transfer, those are all signs that it's a scam. Whatever you're being asked to do is not legitimate. You know, and I think this one is common with, you know, oh, did you, you're, you didn't pay your utility bill and we're going to shut off your electricity if you don't, you know, get a gift card and transfer us the money. That's uh, Those are huge red flags when people start asking you for money urgently. You know whether you paid your bills or not. And again, if there's a question, call your utility company or whoever it is that's called you um, and be proactive about it. The third tip is just to be skeptical. You know, it's unfortunate, and especially I think all of us in rural America, we want to trust each other. But unfortunately, in this day and age, you really got to be skeptical and really do question. If someone's asking you for personal information or money, be skeptical and definitely do your homework. Number four is don't give out your personal data. We talk about this a lot. You know, I mean, any bit of your personal data can be used by a scammer to build a profile about you, to try to steal your identity, or to use it in some other financial transaction. So again, don't give out your personal data unless, you, unless you're the one who's initiated this conversation or transaction and you know it's legitimate. And then finally, and this is something too, you know, when all of us get emails and now it's coming in text messages and all over the place, all these links that are very tempting to, you know, to click on. But if you weren't expecting the email or text or you didn't initiate it, don't click on any of those links or texts because a lot of times those again take you to some place that either it then starts tracking what you're doing, puts a cookie or something onto your phone or your computer. So again, if you don't know the person that sent you the email or the text, 
don't click on any links. Mm, wow. Yeah, Ever. it's a scary world out there. Ever. It's terrible. It absolutely it's terrible. is. But it's... these crooks are so sophisticated now that they're coming at us in all directions and we all just have to be really careful, skeptical, and smart. And share your skepticism with yes. your friends. Absolutely. Yes, absolutely. Absolutely. Yes. absolutely. Yes. absolutely. Okay, absolutely. well we have so much to unpack and we know we have a lot of callers already anxiously waiting upstairs on the line to get their questions answered. We're gonna take a quick break, but when we come back, our special guest, Stephen Richardson, will answer your questions. Get your social security questions in front of you. You might wanna write it down, because boy, oh boy, do we have an expert to share with you tonight. 877-283-7570. Stick around, more Rural America Live with AARP, right after this. How do I apply for Social Security benefits? For retirement and spousal benefits, you can apply online once you've opened a My Social Security account at ssa.gov. You can also apply by phone or by visiting your local Social Security office. Mm, what information or documents will I need when I apply? You'll have to provide your date and place of birth, marital history, and your number of children. You'll also need to know start and stop dates for any jobs in the last two years and report income from any self-employment in the last two years. Have your most recent W-2 or self-employment tax return ready. If you're a veteran, you'll need your dates of service and may need your service papers. You might also need your social security card, birth certificate, and if you were born abroad, proof of legal status. Also be sure to have your bank account type and number and your bank's routing number. Social Security needs this information to set up direct deposit for your benefit payments. What if I'm applying for survivor benefits? If you're applying for survivor benefits, online is not an option. You can only file by phone or in person and should have the same documents I just mentioned. To learn more, go to aarp.org slash social security. Welcome back to Rural America Live with AARP. Social security expert Steve Richardson joins us now, along with Sarah Jennings, regional vice president, and Greg Marshallden, AARP state director for Vermont. All that's missing from this table is you. And our phone lines are open now. We want to hear from you tonight. Let us know, how does social security help you and your family? Or maybe you just have a general question. That's what we're here for tonight. Well, Steve in particular, give us a call at 877-283-7570. And you might just be a winner tonight. We are giving away hard-sided coolers to five lucky on-air callers. It could be you, 877-283-7570. Good luck to you tonight. Steve, welcome back. We're so excited you're with us again. You joined us last time about six months ago. And before we head to the phones, let's talk a little bit about your background, if we can. You were with the Social Security Administration for 40 years. 40 years. <laughs> 40 years. What are the top questions that have amassed over, over that amount of time? <laughs> Yeah, I, uh, it was a great 40 years. It was a great organization to work for, to be sure. You know, we did a lot for uh, the American public. It was a vitally important program um, that everybody, I can honestly say for all the people I worked with, they really took it to heart and they really worked hard at their jobs. So I've got nothing but high things to say about this, the administration itself. Mm -hmm. um, as far as, you know, common questions go, um, the rules can change sometimes with Social Security. You do, you do, see, them, do see them change. One we get is, can I draw from my spouse's account and delay my own until later in life. And this is one of those rules that changed. Um, people would often ask me when I go out and give presentations, and I've done many of them, they'd say, Steve, uh, can these rules change? And I would say they can change tomorrow. And Congress can change them. And there was an act in 2015 that basically changed the answer to that question, because prior to 2015, the answer was yes you could draw from your spouse and delay your own till later in life. It was a very attractive claiming option at the time. Um, Congress and the Omnibus Reconciliation Act of 2015 put, basically put the carbosh on it and said that, you know, for two worker households, of which this option was really geared to, two worker households, that Social Security stepped in and said, look, you know, you two worker household people, you're gonna collect, you know, there's only one person you're gonna collect Social Security from and that's yourself. 
And that's what fundamentally changed these rules, you know, going forward. But it's an excellent question. And I'll say this about questions in general. When you're talking about your Social Security income, all questions are good questions. All of them. You should be asking questions. This is a pivotal time in your life. These are extremely important, you know, questions to ask regarding, regarding retirement uh, preparation. It makes up, you know, 40 percent of your pre-retirement income. Absolutely. So when would I be eligible then to draw under the account of my spouse? <laughs> well, in terms of, yeah, another great question, another great question. You know, you know, Social Security in 1935 launches the retirement program, right? In 1939, it, it acquiesces and adds spousal benefits and survivor benefits to the law. Enormous, enormous, enormous benefits. And spousal benefits are, are in general terms, generally speaking, um, a spouse, you have to be at least age 62. You could draw from your spouse, provided your spouse themselves files for their own benefit, number one. And number two, your own benefit, your own spousal yield, the amount that you're eligible for as a spouse has to be less than your own, wow. right? If your own is more, you yeah. have to draw your own. So it's not that the 2015 rules made the decision to retire and when to file easier, but it really cut to the chase and it really had people thinking more, you know, hard line, streamline in terms of age and income, what's the best time to go? Because that's what this is all about, mm -hmm. right? You have to know all these rules so you can decide what's, what's the best time to go. Yeah, it's, it's tough, especially when you think of 50% of marriages now potentially ending in divorce. Of course, the rules had to change a little bit. So we'll yeah. get a lot of questions just like that tonight. Mm -hmm. And that leaves a line open for you to call in with your question. I want to make sure you have the number, 877-283-7570. Our first stop tonight is Louisiana, where we join our first winner. Thanks for joining Ooh. us, Pamela. We're glad you're with us. Go right ahead with your question. Hello. Um, can you hear me? We can. We can. All right. Um, my husband and I both worked, and we both paid what I paid into the schoolhouse retirement and into Social Security for long enough to allow me to draw a small Social Security check. Now, my husband didn't do that, but he draws his Social Security. Now, when he passes away, uh, and that uh, may be a long time and it may not, <laughs> but do I have to give up my Social Security um, or to, and choose his if it is the bigger one, or can I draw both Social Security if his and mine do? Yeah, or do it, I it, have to make a choice? It's a very good question you ask. And you spoke about the school system. Was this a school system that you paid FICA taxes on? Was it a school system that you didn't pay into Social Security when you were dr and that qualified you for the pension going forward? Or did you pay into Social Security while you were working for the school system? Do you know? It sounded like she did both, but I'm hearing that we did lose our caller. We lost Pamela. OK, it's a really good question. So and the the. Cut to the chase on the last question, which is really the most important. Mm -hmm. Can you collect both? And the answer is no. Social Security will always pay the higher of the two. Always pay the higher of the two. If the survivor yield is higher than your own benefit, than your spouse's, than your own benefit, you would go to the survivor yield. You would collect as a survivor. Now, depending on your age, surviving spouses have enormous flexibility. You can draw survivor benefits as early as age 60. You can't draw your own until you're 62. So you'll have options at 60, provided you're no longer working. You can draw the survivor rate at 60 and switch to your own at 62. You can draw the survivor rate at 60 and wait till 70 to draw your own and your own continues to grow and you get those delayed retirement credits beyond your full retirement age. Or you can draw your own at 62 and then wait till your full retirement age to draw the survivor benefit because the maximum survivor yield is payable when the surviving spouse reaches their full retirement age. It does not increase beyond that. So there were some really good questions there. And again, I think fundamentally, I think the question you really want to, you know, zero in on is Social Security will always pay the higher of the two, not the combination of the two. Excellent. Let me add just one thing too. My father passed away last December. Just to Steve's earlier point, the folks at the Social Security Administration were incredibly easy to deal with, were incredibly helpful to make this happen. My father had a higher benefit, so my mother was entitled 
to that benefit. But as Steve said earlier, these are really dedicated social servants. They work really hard on behalf of Social Security beneficiaries, and it was a really easy thing to deal with, where other parts of that were more complicated, you know, yeah. things that were outside of Social Security. So it's really, it, they make it easy, so people shouldn't be fearful of it. That's great to hear, because usually with government agencies, you don't typically use the word easy. Right. Sometimes <laughs> it can well, be more and difficult. I would say that sometimes the Social Security Administration does need to have a little bit a more help making sure that those offices can stay staffed and the phones can get answered. So that's something if folks ever see your member of Congress, make sure they're getting enough resources that's as right. the SSA so that in situations like what Greg's family went through, there's people there that can help you and you know make that change for that's someone right. who deserves well, it. That's why we're grateful for AARP, who's always knocking on the door. Yeah, we're trying. <laughs> of all the government agencies yeah. to make life better for all of us. And Sarah gave out the uh, website. I want to make sure you have it one more time as well. www.ssa.gov if you want to find out about your own personal benefits. And we're going to continue on. The calls keep rolling in tonight. Nancy joins us now from North Carolina. You're on, Nancy. Thanks for joining us. Good evening. Um, I'm going to kind of answer your question first about how does Social Security help my family? Well, I'm a lady alone at 91. I had an IRA to go with it. That's depleted, so now I'm just living on Social Security. But then this is my question. With this debt ceiling thing that the government was arguing over, uh, there was questions about whether they would lower our Social Security payment. So if I'm getting $500 this year, can next year they, they all of a sudden decide, well, you know, you're only going to get 400 this year? Can they lower my Social Security payments? Go ahead. Well, um, no, they can't. Uh, they can't sort of arbitrarily do that. And remember that the debt ceiling conversation was never really about Social Security. Um, politicians, some of them wanted to make it about Social Security, but it was completely taken off the table. What this was, was that if the government shut down, it would have had a direct impact on the Social Security Administration and potentially their workers and their ability to make those payments every month. Remember, Social Security has never missed a payment to anybody. So this debt ceiling thing was unfortunate on, on in many respects, um, but it was really only about if it didn't happen, were people that work for the Social Security Administration going to be able to do their jobs? And if they weren't, that would have had a huge impact on getting the payments out to you uh, and the millions of others um, that rely on that income every month. Huh. Did you want to follow up on that? Yeah, I think you make a really good point. I mean, look, you know, 15% of women rely on Social Security for over 90% of their mm -hmm. retirement income. So it's important to women and surviving spouses. Is it can, it's immeasurable. It's immeasurable. And you can tell that people would get nervous with a question like that and yeah. how you know, politics can really come into play. But just understand that Social Security will always be there for you. Yeah, and to be clear, just one last comment on that debt ceiling conversation. ARP made it clear to everyone on Capitol Hill and anyone who else wanted to listen that we were not going to stand for having any Social Security conversation about any sort of um, changes to the program within that discussion about the debt ceiling. It was inappropriate. It scared a lot of people. And we want, we were very clear that we were not going to, you know, stand for it. Wow. And uh, I'm gl you know, glad to see that Congress got its, everything. They got their jobs done and everything's been okay. But that, I think there was a lot of anxiety as Nancy expressed, and it was really unfortunate. But I did want to make sure everyone knew the ARP was on top of it the entire time, making sure that the checks would go out as they were supposed to. And, and going ahead of everybody, yes. working ahead of us. We appreciate that about AARP. Something you may not know, this organization is on the ground. They're running around Capitol Hill trying right. to make changes, <laughs> trying to get, I would say, life to make it a little bit easier for all of us. And I think it's one of those noble causes that everybody can get behind. Everybody loves AARP for good reason. Thank you so much for that call. Walter, Massachusetts, our first gentleman caller of the evening and our next winner. Thanks for joining us Yay. tonight. Go right ahead. Walter? We may have lost Walter. I do want to ask a question. Uh, we just heard among the Social Security beneficiaries, 21% of married couples, about 44% of unmarried persons rely on Social Security for 90% more of their income. Obviously, that's not what the system is intended for. What do people need to start thinking about when it comes to filling the gaps, when it comes to retirement? What should we be thinking about, especially people who are joining us tonight in the 40 to 50 to 60-year-old mm -hmm. age groups? Yep. 
Yeah, I think you make, you make an excellent point. I mean, look, to the average wage earner, Social Security is going to represent about 41% of the average wage earner's pre-retirement income. That's just one piece of the pie, and it was never, never intended to represent one sole source of retirement income. But the statistics already discussed today, it's clear. It's, it's clear that a lot of people do rely on it for their sole source of retirement income. And I'll, I'll open it up for anybody else with other uh, retirement options, but whatever you're eligible for with the, your, your place of employment. Um, but just understand, you know, with 401ks and pensions or whatever, um, you know, it's, whatever's offered at your place of employment, just know where Social Security fits in. That again, and it's a, it's a, and I've said it many times, and I'll say it again. The Social Security, the average wage earner, is going to represent about forty-one percent of your pre-retirement income. That's just one piece of the pie. So you're responsible. You're individually responsible for the rest, for whatever your retirement income is going to be a comfortable income. I mean, it's, it's a really important point in my state that we're the second oldest state in the nation. Seven in ten people in my state that receive Social Security income, it's their primary source of income. They may have a small pension, they may have a small 401k, but to Steve's point, it is a critical component part to, um, to a, you know, a retirement where you can live with some dignity and live, live with some purpose. But again, like my state, seven in 10 people who, who rely on Social Security, it's their primary source of income. And I think what we do talk to younger folks about, you know, whether you're 30s, 40s, 50s, you know, and you're not collecting yet, it is trying to figure out, are there other tools that you can take advantage of? It's great if you do have an employer who offers some sort of benefit. If they're, I think the best advice I ever got was in my first job, an older um, employee said to me, you got to put away something, do something into the 401k, even if it's 20 bucks a pay period. And I took, you know, and I took that to heart, even though at the time it didn't feel like I could do it. So I just encourage people to really, if, you, if there's some sort of benefit at your, um, or, or program at your work, place of employment, Take advantage. There's good old fashioned savings, of course. And then the other thing that we at ARP are working on is really advocating for programs to be in states and cities where called work and save, um, where if you don't have an employer program, maybe there's a way to make it easier for employers to offer it to you. Maybe there's another way you can get into savings. So we're working and trying to get creative on how we um, help people have more tools at their disposal because it's hard. You know, it's, this is a hard thing, but we all want to get to retirement or we're doing whatever you want to do, <laughs> so uh, so it's important. Some generations are a little bit more responsible about it than <laughs> others, as we know, so we'll just have to see how things work out. Aisha from Illinois joins us now. Thanks for joining us, Aisha. We appreciate you. Go right ahead. Aisha? Okay, we seem to have lost Aisha, but that's no worry because I have another question. The future of Social Security, you take a look, Steve, at what's happening out there. Um, people who are in their 30s, 40s, 20s even, they're not saving. <laughs> they're, they're not contributing to 401ks nearly as frequently as, as people who are in their 50s and 60s. When you take a look at that piece of the puzzle and then you think about how many people are going to be retiring over the course of the next 30, 40 years, by 2035, the number of Americans 65 and older will increase from approximately 56 million to over 78 million. How does the system adapt to some of these changes? Yeah, I think when you look, if you want to monitor and keep your eye on the economic health of the Social Security trust funds, there's a report that comes out every year. It's called the annual trustees report. And it is it is the economic health of the Social Security trust funds. And it's, it's estimated right now, the actuaries have estimated that um, with the number of people paying in right now and the number of people who are collecting right now by 2034, 2035, there'll only be enough money coming in to pay about 80% of benefits going out. Now, clearly that's unacceptable. And you would think that the United States government would step up and do what they did back in 1983, which was the last time you saw any sweeping reform to the Social Security system in the Social Security Reform Act, where they increased taxes and cut benefits. They introduced the windfall elimination provision. They raised the retirement age. They taxed Social Security income, just to name a few things that they did. Um, so these are the kind of things that you might see going forward in terms of um, you know, what, what Congress will likely do. I, I, I would always go out, my biggest, I, I would, my, my, my three biggest pieces of advice for people when it came to Social Security was education, education, Education. Mm -hmm. I mean, it, you, you can't overstate it. You know, you have to understand, again, all the moving parts and the rules and regulations that sit within this program, you got to get your hands around so you can land on the all important answer to the question of when.
Mm -hmm. What works for me? And this is one of them. The trustees report and where we're going forward is one of them. Excellent. Okay. I want to make sure you have the number to call and join our conversation. It's 877-283-7570. We are going to Missouri where Teresa joins us now. Thanks for joining us, Teresa. Go right ahead. Thank you so much for having me on the show. I have a question concerning the taxes you pay on your Social Security. I am collecting Social Security now for four months. I'm still working full time, but I want to, I'm not having any taxes taken out of my Social Security. What is the percentage of income I need to be saving monthly so I can be able to pay the taxes at the end of the year? Well, it's a little complicated to give you an exact number, but let's talk about taxation of Social Security income, right? Uh, part of the 1983 Social Security Reform Act, Social Security income became taxable income. But as, as we all know, that income that's generated as a result of the tax goes right back into the Social Security Trust funds. That's why it was on a Social Security Reform Bill in the first place. But let's just talk about the brackets and what, you, you know, what, what you're going to be paying. When, when does your Social Security sort of kick in? When does it become taxable income? If you're filing an individual tax return and your combined income is between 25000 and $34,000 a year, 50% of your Social Security income is taxable income. If on an individual tax return, if your, in, your combined income is greater than $34,000 a year, 85% of your Social Security income is taxable income. If you're filing joint returns, it's, it's $32,000 and $44,000 respectively, right? So at the end of the day, if you're filing a joint tax return and both you and your spouse are drawing Social Security, and if your combined income is greater than $44,000 a year, 85% of your Social Security income is taxable income. I'll say this to close out. You can, you can request through the Social Security Administration that taxes be withheld from your check. And you can, you can do this with relative ease. It's a form uh, that needs to be filled out. You can find it on the socialsecurity.gov website. And they'll, you'll get in touch with your local Social Security office and you'll submit an application a request to have these taxes withdrawn from your Social Security check. That's an option for you. Okay. Something you don't really think about is that you're going to get taxed on the right. Social Security check. And there's still a, hand, oh, a handful of states out there like mine, although we've done some work on this, that tax Social Security benefits at the state level, which okay. AARP is opposed to. So we have to, you know, <clears throat> to be taxed once, to have that money go back into the trust fund, makes all the sense in the world to keep solvency so we can keep the program moving forward so that it can pay its full benefits, you know, for many, many years ahead. But to be taxed twice is simply right. unfair. So we have states out there that are fighting that right now. We've done some work in Vermont. There's been some work done in Minnesota this year and some other places where those taxes are being, uh, state taxes are being cut dramatically or frankly eliminated altogether wow. at the state level. Wow, yeah. good work on that. Please keep us up to date as well on sure. your progress. That's awesome. Okay, and by the way, Teresa, congratulations. You are a winner tonight. That leaves a line open for you to join our conversation. 877-283-7570 is the number to call. Marcus joins us from the Lone Star State. Thanks for joining us, Marcus. What's on your mind tonight? Hello. Uh, I was talking earlier about a uh, getting evaluated now for a possible disability from a, oh, it's a 20-plus year accident. Uh, and starting to have issues nowadays. I'm only 58. Uh, we'll be 59 in uh, the new year. Uh, but I was wondering what the process was, again, about uh, setting up the account or being ready, you know, trying trying to be uh, proactive and have things ready in case something, uh, you know, comes up and uh, they start to issue the Social Security. And what is it that I really need to look for? Yeah, I mean, you make a really good point in the... the <laughs> The most important point you make is that Social Security is not just a retirement Absolutely. and a survivor and a spousal benefit, is it? No. It's also a disability insurance benefit. And the program you're referring to is, would be uh, Social Security Disability Insurance, or SSDI. Essentially, what you're filing for is an early retirement, I mean, mathematically, because if you're, if you're found eligible, and I'll get into it in a minute of how you would go about filing, but in terms of how much you would get, um, you would look at your Social Security statement and go to socialsecurityssa.gov, create an account for yourself and draw down your Social Security statement. And you'll find that that the benefit mirrors basically what your 
your, your payment would be if you waited to your full retirement age to draw. It's essentially, with, in general terms, that's where the money lands. Um, because if you go at 62 for retirement, you're gonna be drawing a, a reduced benefit. But if you're 58 years old and you file for disability and you're approved, you'll be filing and collecting as if you're 67 years old, essentially. Mm -hmm. So that's where the money comes in. Um, Social Security has made, you know, strides, leaps and bounds over the years um, in terms of offering up options for people and how they can file. SocialSecurity.gov allows you to file online. Now, the beauty of this, once you create an account for yourself, is you can start the process and then you can come back to it. You know, you can log off and log back in the next day or uh, later on that day or within the, you know, two or three or four day period. How long, however long it takes for you to complete the, um, the applications, because they are lengthy and they can be and they are lengthy because they want to know a lot of information. What I would tell people over the years when you're filing for disability benefits, people would always say, ah, should I tell them this or should I tell them that? Would it come up to me after presentations? Tell them everything. If you have a bad back, they want to know what, what life is for you over, the, over a 24-hour period. You get up in the morning, you make a pot of coffee, you can't even walk across the kitchen floor with a full pot of coffee. You know, you have to sit down in a chair, you know, for more than 45 minutes, an hour a day, um, just to rest, and then you get up. And, and, and So it's this kind of detail, that's really what you want to give them. You give them every possible thing, all the medications you're taking, doctors and prescriptions. You can help yourself in the process by letting your doctors and your medical providers know that you filed. Right. Let them know that you filed so the medical information can be expedited and sent in when Social Security requests it. Well, Social Security is looking at I'm thinking it's probably between three and five months on average to process a claim mm. right now. And I'll say this statistically that four out of 10 who file, it's about 3.9, 3.8. It hovers 3.8, 3.94 over the years are approved the first time they file. The definition of disability to close out is to suffer from a condition that's severe enough that it's gonna keep you out of work for at least a year or have it result in your death. That's the definition they, f they follow. Every case is different. And I'll close with this. People would always ask me, they would describe their condition to me after I'd give a presentation, wondering if they should file. And I always had the same answer and any social security employee would have said the same thing, file. Mm. And then you said four out of 10 are approved the first time. Mm. Would you recommend that someone go back and try again, maybe appeal that process if they don't? Yeah, you are afford, afforded due process. You can argue mm -hmm. any right. decision that the government yeah. makes, including your disability decision. If it doesn't go to your liking, you can file an appeal. Okay. And it's, it's, a, it's a process that, again, you're going through the same, a different medical examiner will review the case. It gets, get looked at, gets looked at with a different set of eyes. This gentleman here makes a really good point. Okay. At his age, he'll start, 58. his condition could get worse. That's yeah. right. And I love how he said, I'm young at 58. Yeah. I Darn love right. that. That's yeah. music to my ears. Thank you so much for that call. We appreciate you, Marcus. Mike joins us, winner from West Virginia tonight. Thanks for joining us. Go right ahead, Mike. Uh, yes, good evening, all. Um, I had a two-part question. The first thing was I didn't know if there was a formula or anything available to um, figure out how much I needed to pay in or what was the average Social Security payment. And also, if I receive a pension, would it be better to claim the pension other than the Social Security or can I claim both when I retire? Yeah, I'll start with the pension question. It depends on where the pension comes from. Again, if you're working for a non-FICA taxed entity, where you're working for a school system or a local municipality where you don't pay into Social Security to draw the pension, you may see a, a reduction in your Social Security benefit. If, you, if you're working at a private company and they offer a pension, there are still many companies that do. You can freely collect that pension and freely collect your Social Security benefit absolutely. at no reduction. You know, absolutely. As far as the app, the average benefit goes, um, it runs about sixteen to seventeen to eighteen hundred a month, in 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 general terms. Now, when you say a formula, as Sarah had pointed out earlier, what's the qualifications? The basic qualifications for retirement benefits, and it's ten years of work. You have to earn what are called quarters of coverage, right? And a quarter of coverage this year is sixteen hundred and forty dollars. So every time you hear, earn sixteen forty, you've earned yourself a quarter. If you started working back in your twenties, by the time you were thirty. 
You had your 40 quarters. Mm -hmm. But here's the kicker to close out. Social Security doesn't look at your highest 10 years to calculate. That's just the bare bones minimum requirement to get money. Mm -hmm. They look at your high 35 years of work to calculate your payment. Mm -hmm. Go on socialsecurity.gov. There's an estimator, a calculator that'll give you your monthly benefit payment. Well, if I could just add quickly, I think the other um, question or the issue that he brought up was is an interesting one in that that having that pension might allow you to delay claiming your Social Security benefit for a few years, giving you a higher Social Security benefit when you do claim. Now, it depends. You know, there's so many different factors, so that might not actually be the case in your situation. But that's the kind of thing you want to look at. And we do have these calculators both on AERP. We have a Social Security Resource Center. At at AARP.org slash Social Security. And then also there are these tools also on the Social Security Administration website. So there are some places out there to go uh, put in some different um, scenarios and try to have it figure out how you can get the most money and income for your retirement. That was, <clears throat> excuse me, a very good question. And again, a financial mm -hmm. planner yeah. or someone that knows stuff about this is also worth, worth consulting because as Sarah said, you can delay those Social Security payments and get a richer uh, uh, income payout if you've got a pension or a strong 401k that can, that, that can get you there. Um, but um, it's important to talk to folks that know a lot about this uh, so you're not making um, sort of an ill-informed decision that you might regret. Yeah, a financial planner can be worth their it weight in be. gold. It can be, absolutely. 877-283-7570 <laughs> is the number to call and join our conversation. Our next caller is also a winner. Mary joins us from North Carolina. Thanks for joining us, Mary. Go right ahead. Yes, I have a question. If uh, there's a death of someone who t uh, does draw Social Security, do you have to send a check back for that month or the next month? I know there's questions about that. Yeah, it's a very good question, and, with, and it's frequently asked, you know, to be sure. Um, Social Security pays the September check in October. They pay the October check in November. So the law says that you have to live the entire month to be eligible for the payment. So for example, if you know you passed away in September on September 10th, if a check does come on November 3rd, it'll have to be returned. Or if it comes on the second, third, and fourth Wednesday of November, you'll have to return that that check to Social Security or the Treasury Department. They're really fast about going in and doing treasury reclamations in banks <laughs> upon death. They're very fast, they're very, very fast with that once, once the agency is informed of the death. But that's a very good question. Okay, we still have time for your question tonight. 877-283-7570. We're gonna pause for a quick break, but stay with us. More Rural America Live with AARP right after this. Welcome back now. We're glad you're with us tonight for Rural America Live with AARP. We still have a cooler to give away. I want to make sure you have the number. Could be yours. 877-283-7570. We're talking about Social Security, and Larry is our next caller joining us from Missouri. Thanks for joining us, Larry. Go right ahead. I have a comment and a question in regards to Social Security. Is it uh, one of those deals where uh, when I started, I was 13, made $179 for the year, <laughs> and I uh, worked Social Security. Uh, that didn't take Social Security until I was 76. And is there an age where you get to where you don't have to pay tax on, because I still have a full-time job. So is there an age where you don't have to pay tax on your Social Security? Now, I'm going to tell you a sad story. My mother was 16 years old, younger than my father. And just like that lady said, my mom uh, died before she drawed her first check, and we sent the only check she got back to Social Security. Yeah. yeah. So is there an age where you don't have to pay tax on your Social Security? Yeah, the short answer is no. Uh, if you continue to work and earn a wage, you will be paying Social Security taxes. You'll pay your 6.2 and your 1.45 Medicare on that 1.45 on everything you make and the 6.2 um, up until the FICA tax max, is up, which is $160,200 a year right now. So that's the only time that Social Security FICA taxes will no longer be taken from your salary. So the short answer is no. We're going back to Missouri where Tom joins us now. Thanks for joining us, Tom. Go right ahead. Yeah, I have a question. Uh, my retirement age is 67. 
and I have all my other stuff, my pitch and stuff set up to get out at 65. If I get uh, Social Security, I take it at 65, how much am I going to lose per month uh, versus at 67? Great question. Yeah, question. yeah, it is a really good question. It's about, you know, and this this is a lot of people, you, you got to really get to get your hands around this. This is really important. It, you're eligible to go at 62, but for the years from 62 up to 67, so prior to your full retirement age, the, year, the yearly reduction percentage-wise can be 6.8, 6.97%. It's when you delay collecting beyond your full retirement age is when you can see an increase of your Social Security mm -hmm. check of about 8% per year. So in terms of the reduction, you know, the, 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 uh, about 6.8% per year, 6.9% a year, if you were, you were to go at 65 or two years earlier. Um, again, there's a calculator on uh, socialsecurity.gov that'll give you the exact amount. Um, just, just keep in mind what your options are. I mean, you make a really good point about claiming options and the delayed retirement ca uh, concept for folks to, who are delaying beyond their full retirement age up to age 70 is a very attractive claiming option for people. Just know what a lot of people uh, fail to understand is that at age 70, you no longer get the 8% increase. That's right. when the, the right. delayed retirement mm -hmm. credit increase ceases to exist. Right. <laughs> and I think I just want to reinforce the idea that there are these tools out there, these calculators, both at, at uh, ARP.org slash social, social security and at SSA.gov. So that you can really go in there and play around and if I take it in this year, what's it going to be and that sort of thing. So I'd encourage you to go check that out. Absolutely. 877-283-7570. I want to make sure that you have the number to get your question in. Harry from Oklahoma joins us now. Thanks for joining us, Harry. Go right ahead. Yes, ma'am. My, I have two questions. And one is I'm moving in 10 days. And if I keep my same bank account and... Uh, let my bank know where my new address is, will I still have to call Social Security? And the second question is, uh, when should I call Social Security? If I have to, uh, do I need to wait until I completely move, or do I need to do it before I move? Yeah, the first question is a good one. I mean, you can call their, their toll-free number, 800-772-1213. If you're going to keep maintain your same bank account, you should still call Social Security, you know, th two or three weeks before to tell them of your address change because they still mail things to you. They still mail a 1099 to you. They still mail the cost of living increase letter to you. There's still surface mail a surface mail process that the agency will take. So it's important they have your mailing address. You can maintain the same bank account. <coughs> that works very well that way. And I, I would say three or four weeks before you can do it. You can do this online as well. So again, 800-772-1213, and you'll get a, a representative that'll walk you through it. Or you can go at socialsecurity.gov and um, make the change yourself. That's a really good question. Yeah. Absolutely, especially when you consider the backlog after the pandemic. Yeah. Have they been able to catch up? <laughs> uh, yeah. <laughs> just a quick add too. When you go back to the issues we talked about early in the program about fraud, that's how the Social Security Administration will always get in touch with you, which is through surface mail. Um, so they'll mm. send you something if there's a problem. Good point. That's what you'll receive first, and then there'll be some instructions in there about call this number so that you can figure out what's going on. So the address piece is critically important. important because if there is a problem. That will be how they get in touch with you to begin with, Excellent. not through the phone. Okay. Audrey joins us now from Alabama. Thanks for joining us tonight. Audrey, go right ahead. Hi. Thank you. Uh, I've enjoyed the program. It's been very informative for me. Uh, my question is that my husband worked three years past his retirement age, which benefited him significantly. Um, I took mine at my retirement age, which was 66 and a half. We both chose to have 15% tax taken out on each one of our checks, and I'm about to retire at the end of this month, and should we have those taxes reduced since there'll be less income coming in? Excuse me. Go ahead. See? Well, I think, yeah, uh, we had pointed out earlier in the program that you can have taxes deducted from, from your uh, check, but everybody's different. You know, consulting with a financial planner, consulting with a tax expert is really the road you want to take here of, you know, in terms financially, 
what works best for you because everybody's answer to this question is going to be different for sure. Um, I think, again, it's very simple to make the changes. You know, you'll know that you can do it through your office. You're already doing it. I'll just say this about, um, you know, the benefits you're both drawing from your own benefits. Uh, um, we've talked about a lot of things in this program and how the importance of spousal and survivor benefits can be going down the road. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Okay, well, what an informative show. <laughs> I a lot of information. A lot yes, of information. Lot. Glad you, Steve's here. Absolutely. <laughs> really appreciate you. Audrey from Alabama was our final winner tonight. Congratulations. Okay. Remember, we do this every third Thursday of the month. And I will say this, for a man who worked at the Social Security Administration for 40 years, and you still speak so highly of the Social Security <laughs> Administration. I think it, you know, it speaks volumes to to the organization, the family that actually resides within. Is is it like a family? Yeah, uh, you know, I would often say to people, um, like Vermont, for example, we have there's a Social Security office in Burlington, Vermont. Everybody that works there lives. Everybody that lives. Everybody lives in uh, the Burlington area. Yeah. You know, so, I mean, if you're in Boston, you know, the people that work in Boston, where I'm from, they're all, you know, they all bought Boston residents and in the, in the offices that exist around there. So it's a it's a big part of it. You know, it's a big part of the community and it's vital that these 1300 offices continue to wow. maintain their presence. And is that long long term employment like you with the 40 years? Is that something that's common? It can be. It can be a very rewarding um, uh, you know, profession for you. I mean, it's a, it's if, if you're dedicated to it and you're ready to work hard and learn and you know keep yourself up on the rules and help people. <laughs> yeah. There's a big part of that there. That's a, it's a driving force behind it. I mean personally for me it was for sure. Excellent. Yeah. Uh, we yeah, I want to be, we'd be remiss if we didn't talk about AARP Social Security Resource Center, which is something we're enormously proud of yeah. and work very hard. There are people at AARP uh, all across the country that work hard on this, so you can see it there. We've talked about the calculator tonight. As I say, has one, so do we. We also have a retirement calculator on this site, which allows you to look at other aspects of retirement planning outside of Social Security. So that really can help you sort of think all that stuff through. But this has all the latest information, uh, a lot of stuff that Steve talked about tonight and other questions that we weren't able to get to. All you got to do is, uh, is just go to the site at aarp.org slash social security. And there's just a tremendous amount of easy to understand information there. We encourage all of our members and anybody else to go there um, if they need uh, to have questions answered, use the calculator um, or find out where they might need to go for additional information. And hot tip, on that website, there's a place to ask an expert, and oh. the expert might just be Steve. <laughs> so if you didn't get your question answered tonight, you might want to go there and ask your question that way. Oh, well, that's a great direct line to you, Steve. <laughs> I appreciate that. Do you have any final thoughts for our viewers tonight? Oh, just, you know, pointed out earlier in the program how important it is to be prepared. It's in, you know, what I would always tell people is, that, look, the same energy you put into when should I draw my 401k? What are the tax ramifications? Who could I leave it to? My heirs? All these questions you would have about your pensions or any other retirement sort of source of retirement you have, you should be putting that same energy into when you should draw your Social Security benefit. Think about it. Education, education, education. Education, right. education, education. Well, that's what AARP is all about. We're Absolutely. grateful to, to you every month. You bring great experts, great guidance. We do appreciate you so much here at RFD TV. And I want to remind you, if you want to catch up on past shows, you can go to aarp.org slash aarp live for more great resources there. We have run out of time tonight, but make sure to join us on July 20th for our 99 Ways to Save. Special guest Chris Farrell will join us, and that's one of those shows you don't want to miss if you like to pinch every penny and maximize your recreational experiences. Mm -hmm. right. Thank you so much for joining us tonight on Rural America Live. We appreciate you so much. Good night from Rural America's most important network. We'll see you next time.